right, so it is August 30th. Reality. August 30th. You know what this means? There's like 11 more days until the NFL season starts. <laughs> which I'm very excited about. You all know that I really like football. It was a big part of my life growing up. Um, but there were, there were a couple years of my life that I actually stopped watching football. So when the concussion lawsuit came out, I wrote this paper um, for my university's paper. I wrote this, sorry, article in my university's paper about the NFL and everything that happened with the concussion controversy, how they responded to it. If you've ever seen the movie Concussion, um, it reveals just how the NFL targeted this doctor who discovered that the ongoing concussion and blows to the head was causing significant trauma to the brain. And I felt so convicted about how unjustly this was handled that I stopped watching football. And in university, I was playing fantasy football. I took this class um, that I did quite poorly in, partly because it was on Monday nights in the fall. So I would just miss it to watch Monday night football. Um, but I stopped watching it because I just, I felt so sick about it. Have your convictions about what is right and wrong ever cost you anything? maybe a relationship. You had very different values and you just, you couldn't, you couldn't reconcile, you couldn't figure it out, or maybe it has cost you money or maybe a job. You felt like I can't work for this company or this organization anymore because they do this and I just don't believe in it. Have your convictions ever cost you anything? What has your faith cost you? This week, we're wrapping up the series on the Beatitudes. Um, and we've talked about over the last couple of weeks how these statements that Jesus makes in the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount confront and challenge Western culture's perception of the good life, our understanding of what the good life looks like. In these statements, Jesus invites us to believe that maybe there's more to life than being happy and comfortable. Maybe the point of life is not just making sure that it goes well for you. And that's really good news because as we look around at the world and all of the crises that are happening, pick any crisis. I don't know a lot of people who feel happy or comfortable. I know a lot of people who are worried about what is the economy going to look like next year and the year after that and how stable is my job and how are things going to go with school but happy and comfortable, no. There's a lot to glean from these statements that Jesus makes. And, and certainly part of what we've gathered is that Jesus is inviting us to imagine that maybe there's a richer, fuller life waiting for us. And maybe it looks a lot differently than we think it should. And it, maybe if life isn't going well for you, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care about you or see you or that your life or experiences are wasted. Quite the opposite. At the end of these Beatitudes in verse 10, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Wonderful news. Congratulations. Blessing on you who are persecuted because of righteousness. Someone kicked you out? Yeah. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see here. <laughs> um, 
this word, yes, this word righteousness could be translated as justice. Um, and God's justice, we know it means right relationship. It means redistributing and sharing resources. It's very different than our world's definition of justice. It's everything being the way it should be, the way God wants it to be. To be honest, I have, I'm not totally sure what to do with this beatitude because I live a fairly comfortable life as a Christian. Jesus in this context is talking to people who have been persecuted, who are going to be persecuted, in fact, who are going to die because they follow Jesus. And sure, I've suffered some cost for uh, my faith, for my pursuit of justice, pushback, ridicule, loss of relationships, but my life has never been at stake. My job was never at stake. The cost doesn't seem that significant. So my question is, what does it look like to be persecuted in our culture or in your context because of justice and righteousness? There will be people, when we choose to be faithful to God and justice, that will not understand it, that will ridicule and berate and smite us for it. But there will be people who see our faithfulness, our integrity, our sacrifice, who see the persecution that we endure because of righteousness, and they will feel inspired, moved, curious, recognize that we have something that they don't. They will notice that we're not phased by fear, that a threat can't stop us, that the hardships that we face somehow shape us into something beautiful. I included in your notes this letter to Diognetus, I think that's how you say his name, from the second or third century AD. And he's describing the early Christians. He says, they live each day on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the laws of the land, and at the same time, they surpass these laws by how they live. They love everyone, and everyone persecutes them. They live discreet lives, yet they are still condemned. They are put to death, yet they are restored to life. They are poor, yet they make many rich. They lack so many things, yet they are generous with everything. They are dishonored, yet even when dishonored, they shine. They are blamed for doing wrong, yet they have integrity, are justified. They are hated, yet they bless others. They are insulted, but they return the insults with respect. They do what is good, yet they are punished as evildoers. Even when punished, they are happy, as if it draws them closer to life. They are attacked, whether by Jew or Greek, yet those who hate them are unable to come up with a reason for their hatred. Is there something that God is asking you to sacrifice for righteousness or justice? What holds us back from making that sacrifice? What holds you back? I wonder if part of the reason that we have a hard time suffering for righteousness or justice is because we try to do it alone. Notice that in this letter, it says they. And this story with uh, Will Campbell, he talks about how this pastor's daughter became an actress in New York. And she explained to an audience one day about her experience going to the school in first grade. And she explained why she wasn't afraid. She said, I had heard the talk at home, at church, on the news. I knew there was something special about going to this school. But because she had been so secure in the love of those close to her, she assumed the crowds had turned out in her honor. One morning when the crowd was especially noisy, she wanted to go back and do a curtain call. because she felt so secure in the love her community had for her. The early church was so tightly knit together. And I wonder if part of the reason we have a hard time suffering for justice and Jesus is because we try to do it alone. What would it look like to feel so secure in the love that we have for each other, so secure in fellowship? that we would endure ongoing persecution for justice. 
how would the church, even our church, look different if we were that secure in our love for each other? You know, I, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about how in these Beatitudes, part of what Jesus is doing is honoring and naming the pe people who he's talking about, the people who the culture has shamed. He's lifting them up. And I wonder if part of our job as a church is continue to continue Jesus's mission of doing this, of honoring and naming people who are making sacrifices for Jesus and justice. Am I freezing or are you guys following? Following, okay. I know a lot of people, a good amount of people at Reunion who are making sacrifices for Jesus, who make sacrifices for justice. And what would it look like for us to say to that person, I'm so inspired by what you're doing, to honor and name it and recognize it and encourage one another, to lean into one another, to be a source of love and security, and even accountability. And we've talked about accountability, not as shaming one another, but to be open and say, hey, I wanna try, I wanna do this, and to have other people in, encourage us along the way. Is there something that God is asking you to sacrifice for righteousness or justice or faithfulness? What is holding you back from sacrificing? Is there someone you want to invite into that? There have been a couple times in my life where I've made, again, not an enormously significant sacrifice, but it felt quite costly. And it was those moments that I actually felt the most alive. Because I believe when you risk something precious for love, for justice, for Jesus, you feel more alive than you ever feel when you are happy and comfortable. And that decision and that journey is far more fulfilling. Is there something God is asking you to sacrifice for righteousness or justice or faithfulness? Let me say a prayer for us and then Drew's gonna lead us in another worship song. God, we um, come before you and just, we just admit that we want the good life that you have the fulfilling life we want to feel alive and at times sure we have other desires we feel afraid we, we just want to relax we want to feel comfortable we want to be happy but deep down inside of us there is a desire for more something that you can satisfy only you can satisfy you have to be recognized that the journey with you um, it involves a cost but the return is so much greater God, would you help us to see the sacrifices that you're inviting us to make for justice, for righteousness, for faithfulness?